how did you know where to start? Well, it wasn't easy. I guess as a starting point, we, we uh, started from where Matt's car was found. The marks on the map indicate lost hope. They're the many places Mark and Faye have searched in the last decade, looking for their son's body. They've searched the length of this road right to the end, uh, looking for places where you can park a car, get out into the bush and hide a body. No matter how impenetrable or daunting the landscape, the Levisons were determined to find Matt one way or another. In the early days, it was, and it still is heart-wrenching, heartbreaking, but in the early days, you, you go out there and you cry, you look and you just cry and you think, where do you start? Where do you start? And it's just looking for a needle in a haystack. You know, we always thought too, our, our, our chance of finding Matt ourselves was less than one in a million. But watchers get one, it happens. So that's what we, it wasn't zero, so of course we kept going. Even though Michael Atkins had now been cleared of the murder or manslaughter of Matt, the Levisons didn't believe him and were now on a personal crusade. Foremost, they wanted their boy back, but they also hoped finding their son's body would force the case to be reopened. Where did you search and how did you decide on where to look? It made us all think like a killer. Well, tried to think tried like, to think like a killer. can't think like where a killer. We'd go at ourselves at about two in the morning and then if we thought places were suitable, we'd come back at the daytime and search properly. As the Levisons spent years combing through Sydney's national parks, Michael Atkins was living it up in Brisbane. It was just sickening to think that another human has disposed of another human and didn't have feeling about it. Can live such a carefree life. Like, like nothing had happened. But in 2014, five years after Atkins walked free, police got a new tip-off, again implicating Atkins. And Detective Chief Inspector Gary Jubilin from the Cold Case Unit reopened the investigation. Why was the case reinvestigated? You, you have a man who's been charged with murder, he's acquitted, case closed. Yeah, the reason it was reopened is that we received information that led us to believe there could possibly be some fresh and compelling evidence and we followed up that line of inquiry throughout uh, 2014. Was there any? No, unfortunately it led to, uh, led to nowhere. During that line of inquiry, during that time, was Michael Atkins always your main suspect? And we look at all possibilities, but uh, all the evidence led back to one person being involved in the disappearance and uh, having knowledge of the matter, and that was Michael Atkins. Crushed but not defeated, the Levisons, with the support of Gary Jubilin, pushed for the state coroner to review the case. The chances of an inquest were low, given Atkins had already been tried and acquitted of murder. But incredibly, in December 2015, the Levisons got their way. Did you guys know that you were such fighters, that you were so dogged? No, it, it's, it's, we think what any parent would do. Um, we now, we've now learnt that we, we won't take no for an answer, and no isn't the response that's satisfactory. So uh, we just, just keep chasing and chasing. He was my son, he was my baby, and nobody takes my baby away from me. I remember a conversation I had with uh, Mark and Faye and uh, uh, their two sons about uh, what they hope to achieve with the inquest. And it was they want the person responsible for uh, Matt's death to be prosecuted and they want to get Matt's uh, body back. I then broke the conversation down and said, if you had a choice of one, what would you... Uh, what would you go for? And they said, we want Matt's body back. And I, I, I certainly understand that. What happened next at the coronial inquest has never been tried in Australia before. In return for being compelled to testify, Michael Atkins gets to walk free, immune from any prosecution except perjury, if it's proven he lied. What makes this unprecedented is that such a deal has never before been offered to the prime suspect in a potential murder case. Could be said that it was a risk. Um, we're putting someone in the witness box that potentially could make admissions in relation to a murder and that we couldn't use that information against them. It was a double-edged sword in effect because uh, we might find out what happened to Matt but we could never use that evidence against uh, Michael Atkins. So it was a significant decision. It wasn't a decision taken lightly. And no family has been confronted with such a choice. 
The Levisons were asked if they could accept giving up all chance of prosecuting Michael Atkins, no matter what he'd done. I got in the witness box and said, Your Honour, we understand what this means, uh, but our goal, number one goal, is to bring Matt home and, and find information. We want to know why Matt was killed. We want to know how he was killed. We want to know where he was killed, where his remains are now. It was clear only Michael Atkins had those answers. But on the stand, Atkins was a reluctant witness who also proved to be heartless when asked to face the Levisons. He wouldn't look at us. He wouldn't look at us and uh, he said like, along the lines, I'm paraphrasing, oh, I'm sorry, I suppose. And when asked what he was sorry for, he said, oh, for their loss. Well, he didn't just say for their loss, but he said for their loss if he's gone, if Matt is gone. Mm. Well, if. Well, at that point that he said that, if he's, if he's gone, he knew that he was dead. He knew that he'd taken him and dumped him of in course. the exactly. National Park. Of course. Exactly. For the nine and a half years, he's just been living a lie. He could have ended this, this nightmare for us nearly ten years ago. Sorry. When he's before the family, he's pretending that Matt may still be alive. Yes, I, I remember that well. That was a very, um, I've, I've seen a lot of uh, courtroom situations and that, and that was a very emotional situation with the family standing before him, him lying to the family, um, saying he, he doesn't know what's, what's happened, yeah. On the stand during the inquest, um, I felt that he was locking more and more into the version that he had stuck to for such a long time. And uh, it, it was quite a simplistic, almost childlike, defence that he had, or version that he had of events. Senior forensic psychologist with New South Wales Police, Dr Sarah Yule, profiled Atkins. She observed a man so bound by his lies, she warned even immunity may not be enough to get to the truth. If you think of it as the carrot or the stick approach, I felt very much that there needed to be the carrot and the stick. The carrot was immunity. The stick was the threat of 10 years in jail if he lied to the inquest. Even then, Atkins continued to maintain he knew nothing about Matt's disappearance. I didn't do it. And then about the Wednesday, um, that's when the table started to turn. At that point, then he was starting to be challenged on his answers in terms of, uh, well, you've said this today, but on Monday you've said that. Are you telling the truth today? Under the heat of cross-examination, Atkins had little choice but to admit to his contradictions. So you've lied the police then? Oh, I suppose so. And you've lied about this, this, this inquest? Uh, well, yeah. Michael Atkins concedes at the inquest that he has lied. If you can be candid, was that a gotcha moment? Was it, yes, now we might have a breakthrough? Well, if I could be candid, it excited me. I'm, I'm sitting in there and I, I saw that and I saw, OK, here's an opportunity. The opportunity was to scare Atkins into action. Atkins was now offered a second deal, but this time he had to deliver or he would go to jail. So what was the bargain? Basically uh, to give Michael Atkins indemnity from prosecution for the perjury. And, uh, in return for what? In, in return for him telling us exactly what's happened. So this was the deal. We've caught you lying. You tell us where Matt's body is and we won't prosecute you for perjury. Yeah. Exactly. If you don't, you're going to jail for, what, 10 years? Potentially, yes, that's right. But and the deal was very important. The deal was not on effort, it was on result. So all the good saying, oh, I think he's here, this is the spot, I, I, I think he is. If, no, if there's no body recovered or no remains recovered, no deal. It was a gamble. It was a big gamble. And Fay often says that it's a deal with the devil. But we do it again in a heartbeat. So it's a deal with the devil because while it's given you the ultimate gift, your, the, what you wanted most in the world, yes. your son back, mm. it's also denied you justice. Yep, but I'd have Maddie back over justice any day. Coming up, Michael Atkins reveals his terrible secret. He found the location to bury Matt's body. He then uh, dug a grave. And the ultimate twist that could change everything. He might be cold and callous, but does that necessarily make him a murderer? Next on 60 Minutes.